Biden makes it official. This is not a time to be complacent. That's why I'm running for re-election. Citing far-right extremists and sustained culture wars, the president launching his re-election bid, asking Americans to keep him in the White House for another four years. So how much of an impact did his announcement have? Plus. After the purging, um, I felt this immense, I remember falling to my knees and feeling like there was this white light just shining on me. We take you out west to see what happens when churchgoers lay down scripture and pick up ayahuasca in our prime focus piece tonight, Tripping with God and... Stack banana till the morning come. Daylight come and me one go home. Remembering a legend from music to activism, the life of Harry Belafonte and the world he left behind. Good evening, everyone. I'm Phil Lipoff in tonight for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are following those stories and so much more right now, including the latest on a California man arrested and charged with five felony counts for practicing medicine without a certification. How the Los Angeles DA's office is trying to find some of his alleged victims. Plus, the number of Americans asking for help escaping from Sudan and why the U.S. government is calling any evacuation incredibly risky and the role a survivor could play in the case against a man accused of killing four college students. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and more for us tonight. But we're going to begin with President Biden making it official. He is running for re-election in 2024. Biden posted a three-minute video today echoing many of the themes of his last campaign launch, again calling this campaign a battle for the soul of America. Vice President Harris quickly endorsing the president, and Bernie Sanders did as well, saying this time around he will not run for president. The stage could be set for a rematch now with former President Donald Trump. Trump firing back in his own video, saying he is eager to get back on the debate stage with Biden. Trump is the GOP frontrunner, still more than seven months away now from the first primary votes being cast. Chief White House correspondent Mary Bruce leads us off tonight from the White House. With his re-election campaign now officially underway, President Biden today firing up a feisty crowd of union workers with his new rallying cry. It's time to finish the job. Four more years! Four more years! In his announcement video, Biden immediately drawing a sharp contrast with the Republican frontrunner, his predecessor, Donald Trump. The opening image, the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Freedom, personal freedom, is fundamental to who we are as Americans. There's nothing more important, nothing more sacred. That's been the work of my first term, to fight for our democracy. He didn't mention Trump by name, but Trump is at the heart of Biden's message. But you know, around the country, MAGA extremists are lining up to take on those bedrock freedoms. Four years ago, Biden called his campaign a battle for the soul of this nation. Tonight, he argues that battle is still being fought. The question we're facing is whether in the years ahead, we have more freedom or less freedom, more rights or fewer. I know what I want the answer to be, and I think you do too. This is not a time to be complacent. That's why I'm running for re-election. Early polls in the Republican primary give Trump a wide lead over his opponents, an early indication we could be looking at a Biden-Trump rematch. There has never been a greater contrast between two successive administrations in all of American history. When I stand on that debate stage and compare our records, it will be radical Democrats Worst nightmare. But tonight, President Biden is welcoming that contrast, touting record job creation, landmark legislation on climate change, the bipartisan infrastructure law, and computer chips made in America again. And Mary Bruce joins us now from the White House. Mary, we've seen it in the polling. Many Americans do not want a rematch here, and yet, right now, it appears a real possibility. Uh, the president's team believes that if Donald Trump is running against Biden, he'll win. They do. And Phil, a rematch like this would be something we simply haven't seen in modern American political history. But the president's team feels very strongly that Biden beat Donald Trump once before and that he can beat him again. Phil. All right. Mary Bruce in the White House. Mary, thank you. 
Tonight, U.S. authorities say the terror mastermind responsible for the deadly bombing outside the Kabul airport that killed 13 American service members is now dead. They say the Taliban got him. Here's Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Panel. Tonight, the White House saying the man behind the horrific attack that killed 13 U.S. service members and more than 150 Afghans in Kabul is dead. A senior administration official telling ABC News the ISIS-K terrorist who masterminded the suicide bombing at Kabul airport in August 2021 was killed in recent weeks in a Taliban operation. You can see in this video, released by the Pentagon, the lone figure dressed in black, identified as the bomber carrying 20 pounds of explosives packed with ball bearings. And the catastrophic aftermath. 13 American service members and more than 150 Afghan civilians dead. We were on the exact same spot one day earlier, Abbey Gate. Desperate Afghans trying to escape. Thousands crowding the airport, some even clinging to the side of this military jet. This is the difference potentially between the life-saving work that's been carried out by the military here and potentially death by the Taliban. Less than five yards. The Pentagon informing the families of the fallen service members of the news. At the time, President Biden warning the perpetrators would be dealt with. We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. But it was the Taliban, acting alone, who took down the key terrorist. And Ian Panel joins us now. Ian, what more are you learning about how the Taliban took down this ISIS terrorist? Uh, Phil, what we do know is that the terrorist uh, apparently, or what we believe, was killed in Afghanistan in an on-the-ground raid. Now, the Taliban, of course, are facing an insurgency of their own. They're locked in this bloody campaign against ISIS-K. Now, the U.S. is making it clear, though, that this was solely a Taliban operation, that they weren't involved in any way, and that they're not working together with the militants. But they do say that the Taliban is responsible for making sure that the country does not become a safe haven for terrorists once again. So where does the U.S. stand right now, Ian, in the fight against ISIS-K? I mean, this is hugely problematic, of course, because the U.S. no longer has a presence on the ground. Now, during the withdrawal, there were criticisms that the country, as I said earlier, could become a safe haven for terrorists once again. President Biden and the administration were at pains to point out that they would have uh, beyond-the-horizon capabilities. In other words, they could strike against ISIS-K uh, capabilities inside the country. However, they are growing. I mean, the Taliban has a severe problem on the ground, and even senior U.S. Uh, uh, military figures are, are issuing war warnings, essentially saying that they're concerned that within six months or maybe more that there could be the possibility of striking targets against the US, not on the homeland, but overseas uh, within a coming period if ISIS-K is not dealt with. Phil? All right, Ian Panel from Marquee of Ukraine tonight. Ian, thank you. Next tonight to Sudan, where a fragile ceasefire remains in effect as there is a desperate race to escape uh, the threat of violence. The U.S. has urged Americans in the country to make their way over land to Navy ships just off Sudan's coast to be evacuated. And this all comes as the World Health Organization is issuing a dire warning after troops took control of a lab with deadly viruses. James Longman reports. Tonight, the desperate rush to escape Sudan. Hundreds boarding military planes from multiple countries as a tenuous U.S. negotiated ceasefire appears to be holding, allowing more people to flee. A senior U.S. official confirming dozens more Americans left the capital Khartoum today as part of another U.N.-organized convoy, making that long and risky 500-mile drive to Port Sudan on the Red Sea. U.S. drones again watching from above, with one Navy ship already stationed off Port Sudan, another en route. The State Department pressed today on whether the U.S. is doing enough to help Americans to get out. The very fraught and delicate security environment makes travel incredibly risky. New images showing relieved U.S. embassy staff after special operations forces rescued them by helicopter over the weekend. But tonight, even as the U.S. works to evacuate U.S. citizens, many remain stuck, like 74-year-old Ahmed and his 66-year-old wife, Nafisa. Just tell me what you're feeling at that point. We felt like this could be the end. This could be the last time we connect with our parents. They say they need more help. We weren't expecting SEAL, SEAL Team 6, but we were expecting guidance, support, 
James Longman joins me now. And James, let's get back to that lab. Fighters have taken control of it, holding samples of deadly viruses. And tonight, uh, the World Health Organization is issuing a pretty dire warning. What are they saying? Yeah, Phil, the WHO says it's concerned about the risk of uh, biological hazard after those fighters took control of that laboratory uh, in Khartoum. They say uh, this lab contains deadly diseases like cholera, uh, measles, polio. These are very, very dangerous pathogens. And just to give you an idea about the breakdown in security situation in Khartoum, we're also hearing that a prison has had some security concerns. Uh, members of the inner circle of Omar al-Bashir, you'll remember that name being um, the infamous dictator of Sudan for many decades. Well, they apparently, some of them, have gone free and they are, quote, looking after their own security. So it just gives you a sense of just how much the situation uh, in Khartoum has deteriorated. Phil? All right, James Longman, thank you. Arraignment was delayed today for the suspect in the killing of 43-year-old Cash App founder Bob Lee. The arraignment was put off until May 2nd after his attorney said prosecutors haven't shared all their evidence. According to prosecutors, Nima Momini, an owner of a California-based tech company, was arraigned earlier this month and charged with murder after allegedly driving Lee to a dark, secluded area and stabbing him three times. Next tonight, a California man accused of practicing medicine without a license for years, allegedly threatening thousands of pa patients, treating thousands of patients. ABC's chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, with the story. For years, authorities say Stefan Gavorkian practiced medicine on thousands of patients, doing blood tests and treating everything from viral infections to cancer in his North Hollywood office. Pathways Medical promoting its anti-aging therapy and vitamin infusions on Instagram. The team posing with celebrities like actor Andy Garcia and retired boxer Layla Ali, daughter of Muhammad Ali. This is Layla Ali. I'm at Pathways Medical. Got my IVs, so I'm feeling good. But the Los Angeles District Attorney says Gavorkian had no medical license. And tonight, he is facing five felony counts of impersonating a doctor. I can't believe it that this man wasn't a real uh, doctor. Who does this? Prosecutors building their case since November when an undercover investigator posed as a patient at an appointment where Gavorkian allegedly failed to accurately address abnormal levels of a hormone that could indicate a serious medical condition. Tonight, Gavorkian's attorney says his client looks forward to vigorously defending himself against these allegations. Matt Gutman joins me now. So, Matt, what's next in this case? Uh, Phil, next there is a preliminary hearing later next month. Now, authorities say that they arraigned him and then released him on the condition that he not practice medicine. Uh, the DA says they are looking for any possible victims to come forward in this case. And it's not yet clear how Gavorkin actually got on authorities' radar. Phil. All right, Matt Gutman from Los Angeles. Matt, thank you. Now to the opening arguments underway tonight in the civil trial against Donald Trump. Author E. Jean Carroll is taking him to court claiming he sexually assaulted her in a department store dressing room in the 1990s and then defamed her when she went public about it. Trump denies that claim. So how will the prosecution lay out its case? Here's ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky. Tonight, nearly 30 years after she says Donald Trump raped her in a New York City department store dressing room, author E. Jean Carroll is finally having her day in court. Carroll says that in the mid-1990s, she bumped into Trump at the high-end Fifth Avenue store Bergdorf Goodman. She says he asked for her help in selecting a gift. Then she claims he lunged at her in a dressing room. It was against my will, and it hurt, and it was a fight. Trump, who did not appear at court today, has called Carroll a liar. Her lawyer told the jury when she spoke publicly about what he had done, he defamed her. Trump has said Carol is, quote, not his type. Today, her attorney showed the jury this photo and said that during a deposition, Trump pointed at Carol and said, it's Marla, seeming to confuse Carol for his second wife, Marla Maples. Trump's defense attorney called Carol's suit an affront to justice, saying she's doing it for money, for political reasons, and for status, and telling jurors they can hate Donald Trump but they can't let Carol profit from her abuse of this process. And Aaron Katursky joins me now. Aaron, do we know yet if former President Trump will have to testify in this case? We don't know just yet. The plaintiff does not expect to call him to testify, Phil. This is a civil case. He's not required to show up to court. 
the judge certainly wants to know the answer to the question. Pressed tonight by the judge, the defense attorney said he still could not say for certain whether Trump would come here to testify in his own defense. Phil? All right, we'll be watching. No, you will too. Aaron, thanks. And here in New York, singer Ed Sheeran took the stand in a copyright trial against him after the family of songwriter Ed Townsend accused Sheeran of copying parts of Marvin Gaye's hit, Let's Get It On, for his Grammy-winning song, Thinking Out Loud. Plaintiffs played a video of Sheeran performing a mashup of both songs during a concert. The award-winning singer denies any copyright infringement and actually said, quote, if I had done what you're accusing me of doing, I'd be quite an idiot to stand on stage in front of 25,000 people. Hundreds of drag queens and allies gathered in Tallahassee, Florida to protest recent legislation that organizers say is attacking the LGBTQ community. The protest comes nearly a week after the Republican-led state legislature passed a bill banning children from adult live performances, which LGBTQ advocates say targets drag shows specifically. The bill, which is awaiting Governor Ron DeSantis' signature, comes after his administration moved to revoke the liquor license of a Miami hotel that hosted a Christmas drag show. There are new developments tonight in that rock throwing spree out in Colorado that killed a young woman when a rock shattered her windshield. Investigators now say at least seven vehicles were targeted in just 45 minutes that same night. And we are hearing from one of the drivers tonight. Here's ABC's Mola Lenghi in Colorado. Tonight, one of the drivers who survived a terrifying rock throwing spree in Colorado that left a 20 year old dead, now breaking his silence. All I could see was a headlight, so it was a dark road. Um, and then a large shatter, a large, it sounded like a shotgun blast, it scared the heck out of me. Nathan Tipton was not injured in the attack around 10.30 p.m. Wednesday, but the rock shattering the rear driver's side windows of his minivan. Authorities now investigating at least seven incidents they say happened in a 45-minute span that night. One of those rocks, according to the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, crashing through the windshield of 20-year-old Alexa Bartell's car as she drove home, leaving this massive hole and killing her. Tonight, police confirm Bartell was the last victim targeted by the rocks. Investigators say they have received hundreds of tips, but tonight, police still pleading for the public's help. We don't know if this was kids pulling a prank, thinking this was fun or funny. Are we dealing with someone who is very calculated what they're doing? The police say they currently have no suspects, but they are searching for a light colored truck or SUV and are asking anyone who may have been driving in that area last Wednesday night to check your vehicle's cameras if you have a recording device. Phil? All right, Mola, thank you. And still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, as a hearing nears for the man accused of the brutal murder of four college students, how one of the surviving roommates is being called on to help inside the courtroom. Country music superstar Miranda Lambert telling us how her newest venture is taking her away from music and into the kitchen. But next, in our prime focus, embracing spirituality with the use of an ancient substance, we spend time out west with a church that says ayahuasca is helping them to find a deeper connection to God. You have people who go into trances. You have the snake charmers. I mean, the, the, the number of ways in which people have altered consciousness as part of their religious practice. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California. Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. 
so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. The belief in a higher power is something that has sustained civilizations from the beginning of time. But what if that higher power comes through an ancient substance? On tonight's Prime Focus, we look at ayahuasca and a movement by some who claim it is a church and credit it with their salvation. Our Trevor Alt traveled to California and attended a service. Hummingbird Church is not a normal church. It has no steeple, no stained glass windows. It's just a converted barn in the backyard of someone's house. But Hummingbird Church does things a little different than a traditional church. Instead of reading from a sacred scripture, this church serves ayahuasca. <laughs> a powerful hallucinogen that can make you see and feel things that aren't actually there. This is a church. You walk in here an atheist, there's a good chance you're, you're walking out a believer in God. And we don't have to tell you anything. Courtney Close founded the church three years ago. And yes, this is a real church. Is this legal? DMT is an ayahuasca and that's a schedule one narcotic. Right. And that is illegal. The plants on their own are not illegal. But when uh -huh. brewed together to make ayahuasca is illegal. There have been cases with the Supreme Court that have been one where churches have been allowed the right, and we believe we have that right yeah. um, to, to do it. And we've been operating out in the open publicly. So we know there could potentially be legal consequences for it, but you don't stop practicing your faith because it's illegal. Ayahuasca is made from plants, but it's not for the faint of heart. It contains an extremely potent hallucinogen called DMT. And along with being illegal, it also comes with some risk. It contains an extremely potent hallucinogen called DMT. And along with being illegal, it also comes with some risk. Rarely, it can lead to a life-threatening condition called serotonin syndrome, which causes a wide range of symptoms, including nausea, vomiting, high fevers, facial flushing, tremors, and agitation. People who have taken it say they experience eye-opening, even life-altering visions. Some happy, some difficult, but often deeply introspective. Because of this, this ancient substance has a newfound wave of mainstream acceptance. Do you guys know what ayahuasca is? Oh, yes! Um, oh, come on, this is Jimmy Kimmel's audience. Y'all know ayahuasca. <laughs> Will Smith saw his career destroyed in a hellish ayahuasca trip. NFL star Aaron Rodgers says it taught him, quote, how to unconditionally love myself. This kind of language does overlap with themes you typically hear at a place of worship. And now, almost a third of the U.S. population say they're not affiliated with any religion. People are exploring their faith in unconventional ways. Is religion evolving in America? Oh, my goodness. Evolving is a sort of light word to use for what's happening to religion in America. Dr. Serene Jones is the president of Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Do you think the direction may be moving away from those institutions is overall healthy for humanity? I think it is. I think it is. I think many of the things that are, that are driving religious institutions um, into the ground um, are reasons that, uh, that are legitimate reasons. Can you tell us a little bit about what role maybe mind-altering substances have historically played in religion? Jesus turned water into wine several times in the Christian scriptures. You have the swirling dervishes who dance. You have people who go into trances. You have the snake charmers. I mean, the, the, the number of ways in which people have altered consciousness 
as part of their religious practice is endless. Religious communities have gathered in all sorts of spaces and gotten together um, to do all kinds of imaginable things to experience the divine. So that's not new. Mm -hmm. um, in the United States, ayahuasca as a religious ceremony is a relatively new reality. But not new globally. The use of substances in indigenous communities is not new globally, and the use of ayahuasca uh, in South America, they can date it at least as far back as a thousand years, um, probably longer. I think we need to always be aware of, especially in the United States, as a world empire and as a thoroughly capitalist culture, how easily it is for us to take things from other cultures and turn them into a product that goes onto the market. I think we need to be very careful about that kind of commodification of a deeply embedded spiritual practice. Hummingbird Church insists their practice is authentic. They bring in a traditional shaman from Colombia to guide their ceremonies, and they say their goals are simply to help people with what they call medicine. Many of their members did not want to be filmed, some citing the deeply personal experience, but several said ayahuasca has led them to a far deeper understanding of themselves, of the universe, and of their place in it. I saw what, what a lot of veterans see. I saw a lot of death. I participated. Um, I, I was a rescue um, in the rescue service, and so my job was mainly saving lives. I still am suffering from PTSD, and I was not having success with the medications. And some veterans called me up, friends of mine that told me about a new way they're treating PTSD through ayahuasca. It improved the quality of my life considerably. I grew up religious. I grew up um, going to a Christian church. I was part of the youth group in church growing up. I was part of the chorus. But there was something there that always made me feel like something was wrong, like I didn't fit in. Um, and, you know, being condemned for certain things. I'll never forget my first, um, my first ayahuasca retreat, my first ceremony, after the purging, um, I felt this immense, I remember falling to my knees and feeling like there was this white light just shining on me. And I just, it was like this higher love that I felt like I never felt before. To each their own. Our thanks to Trevor Alt for that report. There is still much more to get to. Coming up, new developments in the backlash over an AP African American Studies class. The additional changes now being made. Plus, it's a kitchen that truly reminds customers of their childhoods. Meet the grandmothers or nonas who are cooking up a new life for themselves. Many times they are uh, empty nesters. Their spouses have passed away. They have nobody really to cook for anymore. But next, after months of predictions, it's official. Aaron Rodgers is leaving Green Bay. We're going to take a closer look at his career and his new deal with the New York Jets by the numbers. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Brooke Shields, the most photographed woman in the world. A sexualized child model. Exploitation. What happened to her isn't really about her, it's just about women. I let myself be vulnerable, and this is the first time I've ever spoken about what happened. I thought my one no should have been enough, you know. 
when someone like Brooke Shields talks about it, it makes a difference. I'm amazed that I survived any of it. Me? What I'm asking you to do is dangerous. I need your help hiding my family. What do I do? Turn darkness into light. We have to choose when we fight them. We don't let them choose for us. We can't save everyone. But if I don't try, I don't think I'll be able to live with myself. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest story. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table, listen where... Morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. After months of speculation and anticipation, it's official. Aaron Rodgers is leaving Green Bay for the New York Jets. We have a look at the record that has Jets management and fans salivating by the numbers. The Jets are counting on the 39-year-old to change the team's record as the franchise with the NFL's longest playoff drought. $59 million is what the trade and championship hopes is reportedly costing them. The Jets apparently putting aside Rodgers' tough record last year and focusing on his incredible career. 59,055 passing yards puts him at number nine for most career passing yards. 5,001, that's how many passes Rodgers has completed. Only eight players have ever surpassed 5,000. He's thrown 475 touchdowns, coming in at fifth on the all-time list. 45 postseason touchdown passes highlights his greatness in the playoffs and tie him for the second most of all time, trailing only one, the GOAT himself, Tom Brady. Further proof of Rodgers' championship potential, 31. That's the number of NFL teams he's beaten in his career. In other words, all of them. Now that the deal is done, what jersey number will he take? Rodgers is choosing number eight, we're told, hearkening back to his college number and, of course, leaving the Jets number 12 to team legend Joe Namath. As for the future, it is unclear if Rodgers has given any guarantees about playing beyond 2023, but that's a dilemma for another day. For today, Jets fans finally may have a promising season to look forward to. And much more ahead here on Prime, remembering a legend looking back at the historic legacy of Harry Belafonte, both on and off screen. And singer Miranda Lambert tells us how her new cookbook is celebrating the support she says women have for one another. It's about um, having a group of women around you that lifts you up through the good, bad, and the ugly. And usually food's involved in all of those things. <laughs> What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? 
going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Mimp, what I'm asking you to do is dangerous. I need your help hiding my family. What do I do? Turn darkness into light. We have to choose when we fight them. We don't let them choose for us. We can't save everyone. But if I don't try, I don't think I'll be able to live with myself. America every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. 13 women opened their doors to the man who would end their lives. Truth and Lies, The Boston Strangler, the new true crime podcast series. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts and watch Boston Strangler starring Kira Knightley streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. The role a survivor could play in the case against a man accused of killing four college students. The changes the College Board is considering after intense backlash over an African-American studies course. And how a legendary rock music group is making history with the deaf community. These stories and more in tonight's Rundown. One of two survivors of the Idaho College murders fighting back after suspect Brian Koberger's legal team subpoenaed her to testify. The survivor's attorney calling the subpoena improper, saying Koberger's legal team has no authority to summon her for the preliminary hearing. In court documents obtained by ABC News, Koberger's team claiming the survivor may be a material witness for his case. The College Board now says it'll make changes to the AP African American Studies course. The announcement comes after critics said the College Board bowed to political pressure in removing several major topics from the initial framework. The agency says it would determine the course change details over the next few months. The board also said it was committed to providing an unflinching encounter with the facts and evidence of African American history and culture. Minneapolis authorities investigating two different mosque fires over two days. The fire department said the first fire happened Sunday in the Masjid Omar Islamic Center. The state's Council on American Islamic Relations chapter said a man entered the mosque and started the fire in a bathroom. They had it extinguished before crews arrived. The second fire happened Monday on the top floor of the nearby Masjid Al-Rama. Crews evacuated the building and doused the fire before it spread. Police shared images of a possible suspect in the first fire and said they were assuming the fires were connected until there's more evidence. 
The manufacturing giant 3M announcing it's cutting 6,000 jobs. The company says it's part of a large restructuring plan and comes after 3M eliminated 2,500 other jobs in January. 3M sells a variety of products, including building materials, cleaning, and office supplies that include Post-it notes. 3M says the job cuts will reduce costs and enable a more efficient structure. Legendary metal band Metallica has made its newest music accessible to the deaf community. The group released music videos for every song on their latest album, 72 Seasons, with an American Sign Language interpretation on the side. This includes lead single, Lux Eterna. Metallica is reportedly the first rock band to release an entire album in American Sign Language and to feature official videos side by side with an ASL interpreter. This is the new Barbie fashionista. Yeah! There she is! An historic step for Barbie. For the first time in the doll's 64-year history, Mattel introduced a doll with Down syndrome. Mattel partnered with the National Down Syndrome Society to create the doll. The newest Barbie was first introduced on Good Morning America this morning. I cannot wait to see my friends and my peers have a doll that looks just like me. The sight, the sound, and especially the smell of a home-cooked meal can instantly transport us back in time. It's like that scene from Ratatouille. Right back to family dinners around the table, learning how to cook from our parents and grandparents. One restaurant has been able to capture that nostalgic feeling between its four walls, employing grandmothers from around the world to whip up delicious dif uh, dishes from their cultures to share with patrons. Mona Koster Abdi takes us inside an Oteca Maria. Special baccalaro, bacala in Italian, baccalaro and in Greek. I boil potatoes and then I make puree and I put in the garlic, vinegar, oil, little salt, pepper, little lemon, and I make nice dip for bacala. I make spinach pie and they make a chicken and they make with lemon and the a lot of vegetables inside, mushroom, carrots, and uh, lemon, and a potato, lemon potatoes. This is Chef Plumitsa. She's Greek, she loves to cook, and like all the chefs here at Enoteca Maria, she's a grandmother, or Nona in Italian. Oh my God, so happy. Time to came here, and uh, Mr. Jody said to me, no, has it a Greek lady, Greek, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm the Greek. So you come. I say, no, never work in a restaurant. I, I don't know, because the patch too high, I, I think no, no make good food. Nona Plumitsa has been whipping up traditional Greek cuisine for decades, and her expertise is evident in every dish she carefully creates. My hobby, I make everything good. I like to make good everything. Yes, I like to make myself, like my, my mom. At the heart of Enoteca Maria on Staten Island is restaurant owner Joe Scaravella, a man with a passion for food and a deep love for his Italian heritage. The inspiration for Enoteca Maria was uh, the loss of my grandparents and my parents. That's a picture of my grandmother and my sister and my mom. Uh, unfortunately, they were all gone now, but uh, my mom was Maria. And so I named the restaurant after my mom. It's Enoteca Maria. After their passing, Joe found himself missing the comforting aroma of his family's kitchen and the warmth and love that his mother and grandmother infused into every meal. Today, Nona Maria is everybody's Nona. I started inviting grandmothers in, and I'm Italian, so I started inviting Italian ladies in to cook and it just didn't make sense to feature only Italian ladies anymore, and so we just started featuring everybody's grandmother. You have a bore? Bore. Thank you. We have ladies from all over the world, and some of the ladies that cook here have never worked uh, outside of the home before. 
Uh, many times they are uh, empty nesters, their spouses have passed away, they have nobody really to cook for anymore. Well, Plumitsa uh, lost her spouse and she was uh, bereaving, you know, heavily saddened by this. And so her children brought her in to get her out of the house uh, so she could get involved. Maria said, okay, ma, come one time to the restaurant if you don't like, I'll come back. I came first time after I, I stopped here because the people so happy, hungry, kiss me and uh, take pictures with me and the table all the time. When I first um, brought her here, I didn't really tell her that I had any intention for her to like, work here. I just brought her here to, to check it out, to see the grandmas. And so when we first came, the first day, the uh, two of the Italian grandmas were here, uh, Maria and Adelina. And they were in the kitchen. My mom just drifted towards them and just through hand mannerisms, um, through just showing what they were doing with the food, my mother just took to them immediately, even though she didn't know them. I'm happy in the stand in the kitchen. And they like the restaurant because the restaurant is like a village. The people like my food very much, call me in a table and say to me, I like the food, where you make, where you from, remain to my grandma. Okay, now I wear the makeup. The dishes cooked here range from Italian classics to flavors from Greece, Japan, and beyond, with the menu consistently changing depending on the nonas in the kitchen. Italian Nona Maria moved from Italy to New York decades ago and has been cooking at Enoteca Maria for 10 years. I, I like it come over here. You know, I feel so beautiful. I feel safe for the people. I like to cook, I like to talk, I like, 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 like to work too. Huh? I work so much, you know. I keep it busy. When I'm busy, I feel okay. I make fresh cavatelli, you know, con ragù, I make zucchina, I make lasagna, you know, lasagna. Everybody like it too, because they have everything. They have cheese, they have mozzarella, they have everything inside, you know. I like to make something different. You know, every day I cook and make it different. Yeah. I used to full of those, so many things for my grandma. I remember when Maria came in with Lomitsa to cook here, and I says, okay, great, you know, we'll talk about a recipe, we'll talk about some ingredients, and we'll get started. And I was standing in the front with her children, and they looked to the back of the restaurant, and her son turned to me, and he said, I haven't seen my mother this happy in a long time. Enoteca Maria is more than just a restaurant. It's a place where customers can come and experience cultural diversity through food. We saw an article on the internet uh, about interesting dining experiences, and this sounded like such a unique thing with all the, um, the grandmothers cooking. The idea of all the different nationalities, it was, um, we said it was worth the trip to give it a try. The response from the customers is great. They will start to talk about their parents or they'll start to talk about their grandparents. And so it really kind of takes you by the hand and, and takes you down memory lane. Enoteca Maria is a true testament to how food can bring people together and connect us to our cultural roots. It's a celebration of culture, family, and the joy of sharing a meal together. Thanks to Nona's with recipes to share, who are beacons of warmth and hospitality. There's uh, like 200 different countries, and so uh, we uh, we have just a small slice of that. When I come over here, I feel it very happy. The wife did just say, Maria, when you come inside, you are so beautiful, because I, I like it, do it. Because, I don't know, I, I mean, in my heart, the, the food, the cook, the except for the people, I don't know, I like it so much. That looks so good. It's worth the trip. Our thanks to Mona for that. And if you are still hungry, that's good. A country legend is serving up a cookbook that mixes fun recipes and warm memories. Miranda Lambert takes us inside her kitchen with Y'all Eat Yet as a toast to the women that raised her. Lambert sat down with Lindsay Davis to talk about her tasty new project. I'm on the show.
legend in country music, Miranda Lambert. Miranda Lambert is a highly decorated artist earning three Grammys and 14 Country Music Association Awards. The unstoppable force is known for channeling feminism in her songs like If I Was a Cowboy. So mamas, if your daughters grow up to be cowboys, so what? In Little Red Wagon. And I ain't about drama, y'all. Now Lambert is celebrating women in a different way, through a cookbook inspired by the special women in her life. We just start talking about all of our memories and all the recipes that we've shared and all the, the memories that go around the tables that we've sat at and, you know, just felt like really organic. Like maybe we should put these all in one place with some stories of our sisterhood to share with people. Have any of the moments in the kitchen inspired any of your songs? Yeah, you know, I grew up, um, with a bunch of strong ladies. So I started writing songs at 17, and at that point, you don't have like a ton of life behind you yet to write about, or I didn't at least. And so I think a lot of my early songs that I was writing came from things they were going through in their life and from moments that I watched them go through that they helped each other through. And you give a nod to the song that, that many of us know, and you talk about the house that, that built you. I know they say you can't go home again. I just had to come back one last time. Right, in growing up in the small town of, of Lindale, Texas, and you write, it was a place that folks gather to do the important things of life, be together, share, work together to get things done, laugh, cook, teach their children the value of all of those things. What are the core values that were instilled in you that you hope to, to share in this book? I hope this book reminds people to spend time, spend quality time and slow down a little bit and really enjoy each other and because you know, I'm a very driven person. I work really hard, and I, I I think everyone in this, all these ladies do, and we've all had career goals that we've reached and everything, but at the end of all of that, all we really have is memories. I guess what makes it unique is it's really about sisterhood. You know, it's about having a group of women around you that lifts you up through the good, bad, and the ugly, and usually food's involved in all of those things. <laughs> Speaking of memories, you got a chance to visit with Loretta Lynn. Tell us about that moment. Yeah, you know, Loretta was such a special lady to me. Loretta Lynn! She was, like, obviously a, a hero in so many ways, especially in the way of being strong and speaking out and singing and writing songs about things that weren't necessarily popular subjects. At the time, she was writing about them, like, Rated X. And um, the pill. I'm so lucky that I got to spend a little bit of time with her, and she actually made me eggs in her kitchen one time. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> uh, she's just very, you know, at the epitome of what what I'm trying to be. I want to just quote you say, the longer I live and the more I travel, the more I realize how lucky I am to have grown up this way. I always thought other young women were also surrounded by strong, opinionated women they could count on and experience life with. How would you say that these women have shaped your life and who you are today? Since I was a kid and growing up and going through whatever life hands you and then like chasing this dream to be a singer songwriter, they were all there for me. They were front row, front and center. They were my first fans, you know, and I just realized how important it is to have have a support system in anything you do. You recently had to go on leave for a moment from your residency in Vegas for vocal rest. How are your vocal cords doing? Oh, I'm great. You know, I've been on the road for 20 years. I always consider it God saying, okay, you might need to take a rest, take a minute, and then, you know, come back 100 times stronger. But it's just one of those things where, as singers, like, this is all we have, you know, so you got to really protect it. Do you cook often, like now that you have a little more downtime? Can we find you mixing it up in, in the kitchen? Yeah, my husband's actually the cook of our family, okay. so it's funny that I have a cookbook, <laughs> but we do cook a lot together. I feel like a lot of the happiest times of my life have been revolved around food and drinks and hanging out with people I love that are really a good support system for me and that I am for them. Our thanks to Lindsay for that, and you can purchase Y'all Eat Yet wherever books are sold.
Finally tonight, we remember a legend, actor, singer, and activist. Harry Belafonte has died at the age of 96. Belafonte achieved many firsts during his decades-long career, but it was his friendship with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that inspired his commitment to civil rights. Here's World News Tonight anchor David Muir. That call, as iconic as the voice behind it. Harry Belafonte was a legendary singer, a groundbreaking actor, and a civil rights giant. Born in Harlem in 1927 to West Indian immigrants, he would spend some of his youth in Jamaica, that time, those rhythms, leaving a lasting impression on his music. I took a trip on a sailing ship, and when I reached Jamaica, I made a stop. Jamaica farewell. I'm sad to say I'm on my way. Won't be back for many a day. The Banana Boat Song. Work all night on a drink of rum. Till I come back his breakthrough album Calypso at the top of the charts for 31 weeks. It came just before Elvis, and Belafonte had the first album by a single artist to sell more than a million copies. Everybody. Artilla, 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 make me money and run Striking, charismatic, and talented, Belafonte was one of the first black actors to enjoy success as a leading man. There was Carmen Jones in 1964. But I'm off duty. I got a 24 hour pass. Island in the Sun in 1957. The movie was banned in parts of the South because of the interracial romance between Belafonte and Joan Fontaine. There's a great deal to learn right here on this island. Harry Belafonte broke barriers on screen and off. He spent much of the late 50s and beyond focused on the civil rights movement. His friend, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Our great friend, one of the great artists of our age, Harry Belafonte, who will carry on the program. There was this moment in Alabama, next to Dr. King. He would perform at some of his rallies. Now that I sing my heart, yes, you can tell the ladies, cry out for life, as they say. Belafonte later saying he would get calls in the middle of the night to bail fellow activists out of jail and he would do it. In 1963, helping to organize the March on Washington. As artists and as human beings, we rejoice in the knowledge that human experience has no color. In 1985, he was instrumental in helping to bring together that all-star group for We Are the World to raise money to fight famine in Africa. Always mindful of his humble beginnings, Belafonte would say he did not think of himself as an artist who became an activist, but instead an activist who happened to be an artist. This is what he told us about his life. I've won every award, every award. Could I have sung a song a little better? Could I have played that part a little better? All those things wide open for improvement. But in terms of the choices in life, the cadence, where I stood, where I chose to be, uh, what I've said, no retreat, no regret. What a remarkable life and legacy. David, thank you. And that's our show for this hour. I'm Phil Lipoff. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, the new details from the courtroom as Ed Sheeran takes the stand in a case accusing him of copyright infringement. It's a problem plaguing little leagues across the country. Angry parents. Now one league is trying to make sure parents keep their cool. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights.
right now in America with so much at stake. Thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. What I'm asking you to do is dangerous. I need your help hiding my family. What do I do? Turn darkness into light. We have to choose when we fight them. We don't let them choose for us. We can't save everyone. But if I don't try, I don't think I'll be able to live with myself. California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Arraignment was delayed today for the suspect in the killing of 43-year-old Cash App founder Bob Lee. Nima Momini's arraignment was put off until May 2nd after his attorney said prosecutors haven't shared all of their evidence. According to prosecutors, Momini, an owner of a California-based tech company, was arrested earlier this month and charged with murder after allegedly driving Lee to a dark, secluded area and stabbing him three times. Hundreds of drag queens and allies gathered in Tallahassee, Florida to protest recent legislation that organizers say is attacking the LGBTQ community. The protest comes after the Republican-led state legislature passed a bill banning children from adult live performances, which LGBTQ advocates say targets drag shows specifically. Singer Ed Sheeran taking the stand in a copyright trial against him. The family of songwriter Ed Townsend accuses Sheeran of copyright uh, copying part of Marvin Gaye's hit Let's Get It On for his Grammy-winning song Thinking Out Loud. The plaintiffs played a video of Sheeran performing a mashup of both songs during a concert. Sheeran denies any copyright infringement and said, quote, if I had done what you're accusing me of doing, I'd be quite an idiot to stand on stage in front of 25,000 people. Next tonight to President Biden making it official. He is running for re-election in 2024. Biden posted a three-minute video today echoing many of the themes of his last campaign launch, again calling this campaign a battle for the soul of America. Trump firing back in his own video saying he is eager to get back on that debate stage with Biden. Chief White House correspondent Mary Bruce reports from Washington. With his re-election campaign now officially underway, President Biden today firing up a feisty crowd of union workers with his new rallying cry. It's time to finish the job. Four more years! Four more years! In his announcement video, Biden immediately drawing a sharp contrast with the Republican frontrunner, his predecessor, Donald Trump. 
The opening image, the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Freedom. Personal freedom is fundamental to who we are as Americans. There's nothing more important, nothing more sacred. That's been the work of my first term, to fight for our democracy. He didn't mention Trump by name, but Trump is at the heart of Biden's message. But you know, around the country, MAGA extremists are lining up to take on those bedrock freedoms. Four years ago, Biden called his campaign a battle for the soul of this nation. Tonight, he argues that battle is still being fought. The question we're facing is whether in the years ahead, we have more freedom or less freedom, more rights or fewer. I know what I want the answer to be, and I think you do too. This is not a time to be complacent. That's why I'm running for re-election. Early polls in the Republican primary give Trump a wide lead over his opponents, an early indication we could be looking at a Biden-Trump rematch. There has never been a greater contrast between two successive administrations in all of American history. When I stand on that debate stage and compare our records, it will be radical Democrats' worst nightmare. But tonight, President Biden is welcoming that contrast, touting record job creation, landmark legislation on climate change, the bipartisan infrastructure law, and computer chips made in America again. Our thanks to Mary Bruce for that. Tonight, U.S. authorities say the terror mastermind responsible for that deadly bombing outside the Kabul airport that killed 13 American service members is now dead. They say the Taliban killed him. Here's Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Panel. Tonight, the White House saying the man behind the horrific attack that killed 13 U.S. service members and more than 150 Afghans in Kabul is dead. A senior administration official telling ABC News the ISIS-K terrorist who masterminded the suicide bombing at Kabul airport in August 2021 was killed in recent weeks in a Taliban operation. You can see in this video, released by the Pentagon, the lone figure dressed in black, identified as the bomber carrying 20 pounds of explosives packed with ball bearings. And the catastrophic aftermath. 13 American service members and more than 150 Afghan civilians dead. We were on the exact same spot one day earlier. Abbey Gate. Desperate Afghans trying to escape. Thousands crowding the airport, some even clinging to the side of this military jet. This is the difference potentially between the life-saving work that's been carried out by the military here and potentially death by the Taliban. Less than five yards. The Pentagon informing the families of the fallen service members of the news. At the time, President Biden warning the perpetrators would be dealt with. We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. But it was the Taliban, acting alone, who took down the key terrorist. Ian Panel tonight from Ukraine. And now to the opening arguments underway tonight in a civil trial against Donald Trump. Author E. Jean Carroll is taking him to court, claiming he sexually assaulted her in a department store dressing room back in the 90s and then defamed her when she went public about it. Trump denies the claim, so how will the prosecution lay out its case? Here's ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky. Tonight, nearly 30 years after she says Donald Trump raped her in a New York City department store dressing room, author E. Jean Carroll is finally having her day in court. Carroll says that in the mid-1990s, she bumped into Trump at the high-end Fifth Avenue store Bergdorf Goodman. She says he asked for her help in selecting a gift. Then she claims he lunged at her in a dressing room. It was against my will, and it hurt. And it was a fight. Trump, who did not appear at court today, has called Carol a liar. Her lawyer told the jury when she spoke publicly about what he had done, he defamed her. Trump has said Carol is, quote, not his type. Today, her attorney showed the jury this photo and said that during a deposition, Trump pointed at Carol and said, it's Marla, seeming to confuse Carol for his second wife, Marla Maples. Trump's defense attorney called Carol's suit an affront to justice, saying she's doing it for money for political reasons and for status, and telling jurors they can hate Donald Trump, but they can't let Carol profit from her abuse of this process. 
Our thanks to Aaron Katursky for that. And next tonight to Sudan, where a fragile ceasefire remains in effect as there is a desperate race to escape the threat of violence. The UN late today revealing five UN staff members have died as a result of the conflict so far. The US has urged Americans in the country to make their way overland to Navy ships just off Sudan's coast to be evacuated. James Longman reports. Tonight, the desperate rush to escape Sudan. Hundreds boarding military planes from multiple countries as a tenuous U.S. negotiated ceasefire appears to be holding, allowing more people to flee. A senior U.S. official confirming dozens more Americans left the capital Khartoum today as part of another U.N. organized convoy, making that long and risky 500 mile drive to Port Sudan on the Red Sea. U.S. drones again watching from above, with one Navy ship already stationed off Port Sudan, another en route. The State Department pressed today on whether the U.S. is doing enough to help Americans to get out. The very fraught and delicate security environment makes travel incredibly risky. New images showing relieved U.S. embassy staff after special operations forces rescued them by helicopter over the weekend. But tonight, even as the U.S. works to evacuate U.S. citizens, many remain stuck, like 74-year-old Ahmed and his 66-year-old wife, Nafisa. Just tell me what you're feeling at that point. We felt like... This could be the end. This could be the last time we connect with our parents. They say they need more help. We weren't expecting SEAL, SEAL Team 6, but we were expecting guidance, support. Our thanks to James Longman tonight. New York Police Department sending out an urgent warning about thefts at ATMs. They are calling distraction scams when thieves draw a person's attention away from the ATM to steal cash or even their bank cards. ABC's Trevor Ault with more. This surveillance footage shows the alleged criminals in action at the ATM. The suspect on the left drops money on the ground, tapping the targeted customer to get his attention. As soon as he turns, the second suspect quickly steps over, pulling the victim's bank card out of the ATM and, according to police, replacing it with a dummy card. He then steps back to his own ATM and casually walks away with the victim unaware anything happened. Police say those suspects later withdrew thousands from that man's account. Just one example of what the NYPD calls a distraction scam, which frequently targets seniors. This is a na nationwide crime trend, and uh, it looks to us um, like the perpetrators are coming from out of the state and in most cases out of the country and coming here, traveling here with the uh, specific intention of finding victims. Authorities are now warning of the scam, releasing this video recreating how the crime works. They say the scammers first watch their victim enter their ATM pin so they know how to access the account. And that simple distraction, often with money, can create enough time to grab the card and take off. The victim then takes their debit card and leaves, not realizing they're the victim of a crime. And with the now victim's debit card and PIN number, they're able to go to the bank teller and withdraw thousands of dollars of cash from the victim's bank account. Police say the thieves will often wait until after a completed transaction when the machine spits out your card to distract you and take it. They're encouraging all customers to stay aware of their surroundings and in particular, protect your PIN. If you go in and there's people standing behind you, don't be afraid to just either wait until they leave, use a different machine, or even go inside and withdraw your money from the, the bank teller. It's an important morning tonight. Trevor Alt, thank you for that. And it's Little League season. One league is trying desperately to find a solution for parents getting angry during their children's sports games. ABC News' Will Reeve has the story on keeping it cool even as the competition heats up. It's a scene that's become all too common across the country. Parents arguing with officials at their kids' games. It's okay. Oh, my God. And one town has had enough. Little League season is just starting in Deptford, New Jersey. But in just the past week, two volunteer umpires have already called it quits. They're coming here. They're being abused. They don't need that, so they're walking away. Hoping to strike out any future problems, the township's league officials have created a new rule this year. If a parent or other spectator fights with an umpire, they've got to suit up and officiate the game themselves for three games. You are not allowed to come onto our complex until you complete three umpire assignments. 
Once you do that, then we'll let you come back. People are very comfortable making officials uncomfortable. So it's about time that we reverse the trend and started making people uncomfortable who are harassing officials. And so far, it seems the locals support the novel idea. If the parents are going to be sitting there yelling the whole entire game, they might as well use that energy like out on the field. Little League International President and CEO Stephen Keener thinks it's a home run, saying Little League International expects its participants and fans to adhere to the highest level of sportsmanship while attending local league events. We applaud the volunteers at Deptford Township Little League for coming up with a creative, fun solution to shine a light on the importance of treating everyone with respect on and off the Little League field. Will Reeve, thank you for that. And there are new developments in that rock throwing spree in Colorado that killed a young woman when a rock shattered her windshield. Investigators now say at least seven vehicles were targeted in just 45 minutes that same night. And we are hearing from one of those drivers tonight. Here's ABC's Mola Lenghi in Colorado. Tonight, one of the drivers who survived a terrifying rock throwing spree in Colorado that left a 20 year old dead, now breaking his silence. All I could see was the headlights, it was dark road. Um, and then a large shatter, large, it sounded like a shotgun blast, it scared the heck out of me. Nathan Tipton was not injured in the attack around 10.30 p.m. Wednesday, but the rock shattering the rear driver's side windows of his minivan. Authorities now investigating at least seven incidents they say happened in a 45-minute span that night. One of those rocks, according to the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, crashing through the windshield of 20-year-old Alexa Bartell's car as she drove home, leaving this massive hole and killing her. Tonight, police confirm Bartell was the last victim targeted by the rocks. Investigators say they have received hundreds of tips, but tonight, police still pleading for the public's help. We don't know if this was kids pulling a prank thinking this was fun or funny. Are we dealing with someone who is very calculated what they're doing? Our thanks to Mola Lenghi for that. And still to come tonight, a deep dive into questions about faith from a familiar face. The office actor, Rain Wilson, telling us how his new book is taking a closer look at some of life's most transformative questions. But next, a day before Israel's Independence Day, crowds take to the streets to protest instead of celebrate. The judicial battle overshadowing those festivities. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. <laughs> Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from the White House, I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We're tracking several headlines around the world right now. At least 57 bodies have washed ashore after two migrant boats sank in the, in, in, in the Mediterranean off different towns in western Libya. 
Uh, one survivor from Egypt said there were about 80 passengers on one of the boats that set off for Europe around 2 this morning. The International Organization for Migration said this month 441 migrants and refugees drowned in early 2023 while attempting to cross the Mediterranean from North Africa to Europe. Crowds of Israelis have taken to the streets of Tel Aviv again, this the day before the country's Independence Day, to protest instead of celebrating in the wake of a judicial crisis there. This year, Israel celebrates its 75th anniversary, overshadowed by a battle over the judiciary that has opened up some of the deepest social divisions since the foundation of the country in 1948. Meantime, violence continues to consume the country of Haiti. This week, locals lynched at least 10 suspected gang members in Port-au-Prince. The lynchings followed days of confrontations between gang members and security agents. Criminal groups control about 80% of the capital, where about 200 gangs operate with impunity. Haiti's government and top United Nations officials have called for an international force to support the Haitian police in their struggle against the gangs. In an increasingly challenging world, God or religion is what many people turn to, but how about spirituality? Our next guest is a familiar face in an office favorite. You'll see what we did there in a minute. Actor, producer, and New York Times bestselling author, Rain Wilson, diving deep into life's most transformative questions about God, consciousness, and morality. Rain's new book, Soul Boom, Why We Need a Spiritual Revolution, explores the benefits of spirituality in an overflowing world of challenges and how faith and togetherness can heal your soul and possibly the world. Rain, thank you so much for taking the time to visit us. Really do appreciate it. Thanks for having me here. It's good to have you here. Uh, I got the book and I really, I'm, I'm so looking forward to reading the rest of it. What prompted you to do this, this book? Well, people ask like, why is the guy who played Dwight from The Office, why is he <laughs> writing a book on spirituality? And, and I've been saying like, I have a secret inner Oprah Winfrey inside of me that's trying to get out. I, uh, I have always been passionate about big ideas and spiritual ideas, mysticism, reading about world faiths and pondering like the meaning of it all. So this is, you know, I spent the COVID years writing this. It took me about three years, but really it's been a couple decades of me kind of pondering some of these big questions. Yeah, you started off with why is the guy from The Office? I mean, the guy from The Office is a human being and was into other things. He was playing a character. Yes, um, thank you so much. I'll just, I'll just go there. So many people confuse a, me with the character. A character that, I, that people love, by the yes. way. But um, you say it's not cool to be religious. And and this, this would probably be controversial for a lot of people because a lot of people see, you know, folks going away from religion and more towards spirituality, which you write about. So why do you say, why do you say that? Well, you know, I'm in the comedy world in Los <laughs> Angeles, which is one of the most jaded, cynical, everyone claims they're like nerdy, but it's all about being cool on, on kind of different levels. And for a guy, you know, making comedy, talking about God and the soul and life after death and, and meaning and sacredness, th that whole world, they have no idea what to do with me. I am truly, I'm an outcast among outcasts. But to be honest with you, that's what drew me to it. Okay. You know, th that dichotomy. I, I love right. that. And, and everybody's got something to say. And, and you, you, you took three years and you really, you really go into this. You, you look at faiths and yeah. you, you, you tie the commonality in. Why do you think we need a spiritual revolution, as you put it on the front cover, right now? I love it. That's the perfect question to ask. So the world is hurting right now. This is not like a hobby or a side project for me. Uh, this is something that I am... I couldn't be more passionate about. The world is in a world of hurt. The mental health crisis among young people is devastating. Suicides are up by three times. Anxiety, depression, loneliness, it's killing people. Literally. It's tearing our political system apart. And we have war in Europe and the threat of war is looming. We've been through this pandemic, but we're suffering multiple other pandemics. We're suffering racism materialism, uh, climate change is a pandemic, sexism, all of militarism, all of the things that are bringing out the worst in humanity. We need a spiritual revolution because I truly believe that there are spiritual tools from a kind of a, an ancient spiritual toolkit that we can draw on, that we can use to heal not only ourselves personally, but our society. You use humor in here, but you also quote, you also quote from, you know, Scripture at times, what, yep. and, and, and I, I just, I think what you just said is so important. And I think it boils down to kindness. 
Mm. If, if, if I'm listening to what you're saying okay. and you're taking the, the best from, from religions and, and talking about it in a way in this book that like if people were just kinder to each other. Yeah, yeah. I talk about the universals of the world's faiths. All of the great spiritual teachers from Lord Krishna to the Buddha to Moses and Abraham to Jesus and Mohammed to Baha'u'llah, all of these great spiritual teachers essentially have the same message. When you strip away all of the accoutrement of the religion itself, it does boil down to compassion, loving kindness, humility, uh, the qualities of the divine that we have within us, and serving the people who deserve to be served, the poor, the downtrodden. And, you know, social psychologists and, and positive psychologists are learning that the more we serve others and give ourselves to others, the, the more full we feel. Yeah. And a lot of the problems you mentioned would be fixed yeah. if if we were just kinder to, to one another. I, 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 I am into the book. I'm into what you're talking about. And I'm really, really, really glad you stopped by. It's I love it. It's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, and thanks for the book. By the way, uh, his book, Soul Boom, Why We Need a Spiritual Revolution. He just told you some of it, but you got to read the book. It's out where books are sold now. And still to come, using motherhood as an inspiration, how the mother of a son with autism is using her personal experiences to write a special children's book. Meep, what I'm asking you to do is dangerous. I need your help hiding my family. What do I do? Turn darkness into light. We have to choose when we fight them. We don't let them choose for us. Save everyone. But if I don't try, I don't think I'll be able to live with myself. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. April is Autism Acceptance Month, and ABC's Morgan Norwood shares the story of a mother's journey raising her son with autism and how it inspired her to write a children's book about being kind to others. His diagnosis turned my world around before the better. When DeAndra Perry's son Cameron was first diagnosed with autism at a young age, she knew very little about the disorder. And she says Cameron's doctor told her he would have a difficult life. She's just like, he's never going to talk. He's never going to play in a park. He's never going to have friends. But DeAndra was motivated to prove the doctor wrong. And after Cameron began going to school around age five, he started speaking. It was like small little words, you know? But it meant so much to us. Like, we would celebrate. Today, 13-year-old Cameron is thriving. We go play bingo. Everything that the doctor told me he wasn't going to do, he's doing it. I'm really proud of him. He's super outgoing, very loving, charming, and kind, giving. About four years ago, DeAndra took Cameron to the park and says she saw something special. You know, Cameron was flapping his hands, and he was super excited, introduced himself to the other children. He said, hi, my name is Cameron. Do you want to play? DeAndra recalls some of the kids keeping their distance. I think it's because he was flapping his hands, and, you know, he's kind of big for his age, and he talks like a baby. But she adds, one child had a different approach. His name was Omar. I'm never going to forget him. Omar asked DeAndra what was going on with Cameron, and she explained that Cameron has autism, breaking it down in a kid-friendly way. And when I broke it down, he said, oh, that's not a problem. We can help him. He can play with us. He just needs help. And it was a really special moment for me. 
The interaction inspired Deandra to write a children's book entitled Cam's World. We are all running and having so much fun. Deandra hopes the book can help other families. And not just families who are on the spectrum, families who are not on the spectrum, and they can teach their children about being kind and understanding. It costs nothing to be kind. No, it doesn't. All right, Morgan, thank you for that. And that's our show for tonight. I'm Phil Lipoff. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. And by the way, you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com. Good night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families.